chapter six of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter six two and two are five the boys were off bright and early the next morning virginia and sally going with them in the carriage under uncle reuben's guardianship as far as the landing colonel trevilian had intended going too on his gray horse but at the last moment he was called away on urgent business in another direction there seemed likely to be a hitch in the plans for a while but virginia had pleaded oh mother it's all planned and sally will be so disappointed and so will matt delano for we were going to stop there for dinner and take her down to the boat with us now mother please uncle reuben will take good care of us father that last appeal won the day as it had since she was old enough to put her arms around his neck and say in just this tone now father oh yes my dear i think they may as well go mr delano will ride down from independence to the boat with them and virginia flew upstairs to get ready miss abby was a good deal scandalized on two counts first they would be absent from the opening of school which seemed to her far more important than any mere leave-taking and second they would have to ride back all that distance alone with this old negro she spoke of this to miss nanny afraid to have them go with uncle reuben exclaimed miss nanny why he is as trustworthy as the apostle paul he has driven these children around ever since they were born and their father and grandfather before them mercy uncle reuben the ride to independence was a long one but it seemed all too short to-day it was likely to be the last one they would take together for a good while the roads had dried up the day was fine and sally was never in higher spirits which is saying a great deal for sally's spirits were of the effervescing type she and beverly kept things going and it was well they did for gordon was rather quiet and virginia's gaiety intermittent once sally got out to get some flowers of which the prairie was full and beverly followed her to see that she did not get left he said or snake bitten and they could hear her shrieks as he laid this danger forcibly before her gordon moved across to the place beside virginia but when he was there and the opportunity had come for confidential talk he could think of nothing but commonplaces to say and the time so short when the train is coming and we stand on the platform and know that in a moment our chance will be gone and that when it is we shall think of a hundred things that we wanted to say our brains seem palsied and all we can think of is be sure to write and did you get everything gordon could not tell her all the things that clamoured for utterance there was not time and this was not the place besides he had but little of the small change of conversation and when he thought of nothing worth while to say said it a strange constraint had fallen upon virginia too and when they did talk it did not seem altogether satisfactory outside on the prairie beverly was saying of course you'll write to me sally i don't know sally returned teasingly you write to me and maybe i'll answer huh maybe i'll write said beverly sally laughed and then said seriously beverly trevilian you know you don't care for my letters you would rather have two pages from lois chandler than ten from me now honest wouldn't you beverly caught her hands and held them sally he said solemnly let me look into your eyes i think i caught the reflection of the prairie just the least little speck of it but sally had turned her eyes away everybody can see it but virginia she said sally you are talking nonsense what could lois chandler ever be to me he spoke impatiently but as if his impatience were more at a situation than at her 
i'm sure she's a very nice girl said sally with a woman's contrariety then she laughed beverly it is so funny virginia thinks gordon likes lois and i halfway think so myself he turned quickly toward her you do pshaw well i said halfway you needn't look at me like that when they reached the carriage which had stopped at their call gordon kept his seat sally you are not old enough to have conscientious scruples about riding backward are you he found his place satisfactory at any rate gordon i am devoted to you i would strangle any scruple that would not give you the opportunity of looking forward she said settling herself beside beverly at independence they had a disappointment matt delano had other company and was not able to go down to the boat with them but mr delano dropped everything to ride down with them on horseback and see the boys off as colonel trevilian had requested their good-byes were spoken at the gangway gordon whispering hurriedly as he held her hand will you write to me virge and virginia answered quietly yes sally threw parting jests to the last then the plank was drawn in the boys disappeared and reappeared on the guards the churning of brown waters began hats were lifted from two handsome heads two white hands were waved from the shore there was a hearty good luck to you boys and they were off the girls did not look at each other till they had said good-bye to mr delano and were in the carriage as they started virginia leaned forward to give some direction to uncle reuben when she turned toward her friend a shocked expression came over her face why sally she cried sally for sally was lying in an ignominious heap in the corner of the carriage shaken with sobs i know just how you feel said virginia with consummate tact and an ominous heaving of her own breast i feel that same way about brother and gordon is just like a brother to you on the thomas h benton the two young men were stowing away their belongings in their state-rooms and preparing for the journey which even with clear sailing would be like an ocean passage of to-day for length if they struck a sandbar there was no telling when it would end they sat out late that night on the guards watching the endless processions of trees willows and cottonwoods and sycamores pass by in ghostly file dreaming young men's dreams of the future and planning their lives with as much confidence as if there were no unknown factors to deal with you will get through in two years beverly was saying yes and then well i rather think i'll settle in kansas city if it is large enough by that time to support another physician father thinks it is going to make quite a town you never had any leaning toward medicine no sir when i come back for good it will be to take up life at keswick i think it would break father's heart if i should do anything else you see the trevilians have been planters in virginia from time immemorial and i suppose i have a sort of inherited love of the soil i'm going to be a planter in missouri only it won't be tobacco alone that i'll plant and i will probably be called by the less high-sounding name of farmer still with the two thousand acres that will be mine some day i think i might almost be called a planter it was of their prospects they talked of establishing themselves of prosaic plans for making a livelihood but they were verging upon manhood's estate and who can doubt that mingled with their thoughts of drugs and crops were dreams of fair faces and bright eyes eden was incomplete until woman came she brought trouble with her it is true as she has brought it ever since but she was fair to look upon and from that time to this when adam's sons have planted them gardens they have not had the resolution to shut her out so gordon's thoughts were of virginia and the heir of keswick's with beverly said gordon breaking a silence that had lasted long you placed me in a very uncomfortable position the other day did you know it no beverly lifted his eyes from the contemplation of the flashing spray of the side wheel to look in genuine surprise at his companion when the day you left virginia thinking i had been 
walking down in the woods with lois chandler she wasn't that funny broke in beverly with a laugh you know i believe she had a sort of suspicion that she was wrong for she asked me at supper time where i was that morning what did you tell her told her i was out hunting as i was she thought it took me all morning to get those few prairie chickens i suppose and he laughed again i don't see anything very funny about it gordon said with uncompromising gravity i wish you would look at it seriously i couldn't tell her the truth because i had promised you not to but i tell you i didn't like the position it placed me in oh said beverly lightly she'll never think of it again she will think of it she asked me again to-day when you and sally were getting the flowers if it was lois i was walking with that morning the very fact that i don't tell her naturally makes her think there is something wrong something i'm keeping back i think you ought to have told her oh gordon you don't know what wrath i would have brought down on my poor head father won't hear to my looking at a girl who hasn't a pedigree as long as the moral law and mother isn't much better i wouldn't quite say that they think it a crime for a person not to have a grandfather and a great-grandfather perhaps not even a misdemeanor but an indiscretion certainly these old virginia families have tar-bucket memories and they always want to look it up in the herd book confound it why is it that the prettiest girls never had any pedigree and the ugly ones there's molly driscoll now counts back to the time of the flood a little before i believe and who would ever want to go with molly driscoll let her keep the company of her antediluvian ancestors i say gordon was not to be diverted i wish you would absolve me from my promise he said soberly i ought never to have made it in the first place no sir beverly shook his head in a tantalizing way but there was an undercurrent of purpose beneath the light words i hold you to that promise you said upon honor that you would never tell until i said you might and i won't release you from it you are never to let on in any manner that i've ever been in the habit of going down to old man chandler's you've promised besides gordon he continued in expostulation you know it is all in fun there can never be anything serious between lois chandler and me why it is ridiculous gordon lay pushed his chair back and stood up as if to end the conversation then drop it he said roughly and drop it now if you are not in earnest stand aside and let some honest fellow go in that is an affair of this sort that can neither be carried on in the open nor be treated seriously will lead to no good he left him as abruptly as he had spoken it was the nearest approach to a quarrel the two had ever had beverly turned and looked after him amazement in every feature well by jove he said i halfway believe sally is right who is the honest fellow that wants to go in in earnest can it be himself he sat there late into the night looking at the white spray as it fell from the wheel and thinking no not quite thinking but letting his thoughts stray whithersoever they would and they strayed oftenest to the humble house where sweet-faced lois chandler lived alone with her peculiar father the girl was wonderfully pretty and she was good too if she only had a pedigree the white spray still dashed from the wheel there was a fascination in watching it how pure it was how it flashed in the starlight and how irretrievably it was lost when it touched the black vortex below i don't know but he is right he thought i'm glad i am going away she'll forget me before i get back and maybe i'll forget her i hope so anyway and then a vision flitted before him of lois chandler's blue eyes in which there had been just a hint of tears when he saw them last and the golden hair which fell about her face in such profusion and had somehow enmeshed itself about his heart and the soft cheek that was like a rose-leaf and he was not sure that he wanted to be quite forgotten after all End of chapter 6chapter seven of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Recording by John Brandon. Order number eleven by Carolyn Abbott Stanley. Chapter seven Miss Abbey on Domestic Economy. It was November, the season when the wise woman who looketh well to the ways of her household and is not afraid of the snow must be up and doing in old Missouri for that household was literally to be clothed in scarlet the ladies were all seated one day in mrs trevelyan's room which looked like an oriental bazaar with its gay plaid linseys covering every available space mrs trevelyan sat by the bed cutting out the woman's winter dresses and miss nanny's deft fingers were rapidly transforming them into garments there was an open fire in the room and miss abby sat in front of it doing her saturday's darning an onerous task for her hands which were better trained to the pen than to the needle she felt almost dizzy at the rapidity with which work was being turned off today by those experienced seamstresses miss abby had settled down into the most comfortable relations with the trevelyan family in spite of widely differing ways she had actually learned to lie in bed and have her fire made so seductive are luxurious habits even to those born of puritan stock and brought up on the east wind the school was well started not without some few tilts between teacher and patrons it is true and was progressing finely miss abby had wanted to start a class in physiology which was vetoed by the mothers who said that physiology might be well enough for boys perhaps but it was certainly indelicate for girls they had them take instead geography of the heavens as being more practical and grecian mythology as less likely to corrupt the imagination nan said miss trevelyan unrolling a bundle of blue jeans see if you can find me uncle reuben's coat pattern it's marked with his name miss abby looked up in astonishment you don't tell me you make the men's clothes too why of course returned mrs trevelyan who else would make them don't the women sew at all they do their mending but they couldn't really be expected to make their clothes they have their other work to do miss abby sniffed i know you think they don't work very hard miss abby but there's Colon now she does all the washing for the family with liz's help and the ironing what time would she have to sew plenty of time said miss abby severely she had made a number of observations since she had been on this easy-going farm and one of them was that there was a great waste of time as well as other things a sinful waste she called it she had long wanted an opportunity to express her mind about it caroline could do the washing and ironing in two days three at most my mother used to do the washing for a family of nine and get it out by ten o'clock i've heard her say often that she would feel disgraced to hang out a washing after dinner all her work was done up in the forenoon what time did she get up asked miss nanny at four o'clock on wash days winter and summer had to to get it done by ten was there any law requiring it be done by ten it was the custom of the country said miss abby shortly she did not like miss nanny's satirical air well sister betty suppose we adopt that custom suggested miss nanny blandly it would probably keep you awake the best part of the night and it would rout brother william out to wake caline and she would rouse the rest of the family rummaging round for the clothes but it might end up in her getting started by ten o'clock that would be something gained did you ever try to hurry a darky miss abby no said miss abby with significant emphasis thank god i've never had anything to do with them but i thought not interpolated miss nanny i can see no reason why they should not be trained to habits of system and the economical use of time the same as anybody else 
i am sure mrs trevelyan that my mother could get three times as much out of these negroes as you do i don't doubt it returned mrs trevelyan dryly it was a well-known fact in virginia that the northern overseers got more work out of the negroes than anybody else and were hard around them you can easily see why it was not that they were more hard-hearted they simply expected them to do as much work as white men and southern people never expect that they know them too well i think it ought to be expected it is no kindness to let them dawdle over their work it is not surprising that miss abby thought they dawdled over their work they certainly did as one looks back upon it now it seems strange how they ever kept up a pretense of being busy for with so many to do the work there was a minute subdivision of labor in those homes that would have been amusing to a brisk new england housekeeper accustomed as miss abby had said to getting her work done up in the forenoon if she had not from long habit shut her eyes to all but the darker sadder side how to keep them busy was really a problem and the question that mrs trevelyan put now to miss abby was the keynote to the difficulty what would carline do the rest of the week if i insisted on her finishing by wednesday she might learn to sew miss abby laid down her work and assumed her argumentative expression she was on her native heath when arguing but if she does the laundry work that is enough for her to do it is her part it is a very small part of what an energetic new england woman would do said miss abby she still felt that these people did not know what a real day's work was i suppose so returned mrs trevelyan quietly but if we should work our negroes as hard as the new england women work themselves you would have reason to abuse us well urged miss abby if they worked faster they could get through and have some time to rest but they would rather take their rest as they go along and why not it is a waste of time declared the new england woman i think we will be held accountable for that as well as for a waste of other things what things she did not say she shut her lips firmly together lest they should release what was behind them the truth was that the prodigality of this household was almost more than she could see go by unrebuked why they sometimes ate six chickens a day nine miss nanny had told her when they first began to use them three broiled for breakfast three fried for dinner and three smothered for supper such wasteful extravagance why didn't they wait till the chickens were full grown before they began eating them she had asked mrs trevelyan one day how many she raised about five hundred she had replied and then to miss abby's remark that they must bring her in quite a sum had added in surprise oh we never sell any we raise them entirely for our own use but we have a good deal of company then there were the cows miss abby had counted them one day when the women were milking thirteen and they never sold a pound of butter she had spoken to mrs trevelyan about that one day too my if her father had those thirteen cows how much he would make from them but mrs trevelyan had only said no we never sell any aunt viney doesn't like to be stinted neither do we my family like butter better than anything that butter will buy but thirteen cows miss abby had gasped of course we give about half the milk to the calves explained the beleaguered housekeeper driven to it to explain her ways to this stern economist and we use a great deal of cream we give our calves skim milk suggested miss abby well we don't it was spoken as curtly as it was in this well-balanced lady to speak the truth is nobody likes to have their own particular faults of management 
made matters of astonished comment even by those who can manage better miss abby used to walk around and mentally estimate what this thing and that sacrificed so needlessly here would bring in boston the apples for instance why there were barrels and barrels of them going to waste she could not forbear speaking of it one day mrs trevelyan had said why we have enough to last us as long as they will keep the apple holes are full and we have dried them and made apple butter it did seem to her that they were blameless on the apple question but miss abby had persisted couldn't you find a market for them in kansas city oh we never sell them was the reply mr trevelyan hasn't time to bother with a few bushels of apples besides the hogs eat them it seemed to miss abby that the waste of time on this place was after the same pattern she returned to it now if they should work more expeditiously she said with some hesitation she felt a little in doubt herself about the propriety of what she was about to say and still more about how it would be taken they would have time for something else besides work reading for instance but who would have time to teach them asked mrs trevelyan nan and i are busy making their clothes and attending to those that are sick virginia did try once she and liz had a great time of cleaning out the hen-house and fixing it up for a school for the little negroes do you remember it nan but she soon got tired of it you can't teach them said miss nanny they haven't the minds that white people have i should like to try it said miss abby firmly you can never make me believe that the almighty made human beings and left out the brains you may try it said mrs trevelyan promptly you can take them any time you want to of course you would have to teach the men at night miss abby was thunderstruck do you mean it she gasped here's the opportunity that of all things she had longed for she could not believe that it had actually come how her father would rejoice that it had been given to her to minister to these poor thirsting souls isn't there a law against teaching the slaves she asked i really don't know whether there is in this state or not there is in the south but nobody pays any attention to it it is simply a precautionary law we can do as we please with our own servants but the law is made so that if anybody should come down here and attempt to make trouble in that way he could be stopped miss abby was amazed i never had thought of it in that way she mused thoughtfully i always supposed it was a criminal offence for anybody to teach them anything not at all it is difficult but not criminal you are welcome to try it if you can get them to come i imagine there will be no trouble about that said miss abby miss nanny raised her eyebrows and smiled no time was lost in getting the new project on foot colonel trevelyan was consulted and gave prompt consent he even suggested the use of the loom room now unoccupied for the new schoolhouse the loom house academy miss nanny christened it and virginia rummaged the attic for old first readers the little negroes were jubilant at the thought of having a school of their own supposing it would make them white and the men looked foolish and joked over it but were willing to try but miss abby felt pained at heart by the apathy of the women she could not understand their indifference when such a vital point as their education was at stake perhaps mammy voiced the trend of feminine sentiment more clearly than anybody else mammy asked miss nanny affably a few days later are you going to attend the loom house academy no i ain't said mammy with decision she ain't give me nothin since she's been here end of chapter seven recording by john brandon chapter eight of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Recording by John Brandon. Order number eleven by Carolyn Abbott Stanley. Chapter eight A Spirited Maiden. Virginia Trevelyan, in her becoming riding habit and jaunty cap, was riding at a leisurely gait along the road that led from Dr. Lay's to Keswick in her lap was a bundle which explained her errand but whose dog-eared contents could never have been guessed from its neat exterior with the same enthusiasm that had engineered a chicken funeral or a baptizing in her youthful days virginia had undertaken to provide books for the loom house academy she had ransacked the garret and bookcase at home for old primers spelling books readers and whatever else had the alphabet in it and most books had in those days and this afternoon she and sally had done the same thorough job at dr lay's she must have been pleased with the result for she was smiling to herself at that or something it was probably something for that search among the old books with gordon lay's name in them had brought vividly to mind the days gone by when they had measured the flight of time by the page of webster's spelling book and the height of their attainments by the reader they were in those old books had a good deal of scribbling in them she found a large part of it hers and she was thinking that she would look over them to-night with an eraser before they were put into circulation miss abby might get hold of them old school books tell so much more than their authors ever dreamed of sally had shown her a letter from gordon and there had been in it a note to herself which she had slipped in her bosom forgetting she had a pocket she was trying to recall the exact words of something in that note twice she started to take it from its hiding place and each time she stopped i won't i'll wait till i get down to the old grapevine tree she told herself that was where she always read her letters from him he was getting along finely at transylvania he wrote but he missed the prairie just as she had reached this decision for the second time a slight sound came to her ears and she looked back a man on a white horse was emerging from the timber which she had just passed through with a quick frown she gave rob roy's bridle the jerk that started him into a rack she did not wish to appear to be running away she said to herself distinctly that she was not but she meant to get to the fork of the road before amon's bear did but the hoofbeats behind were coming nearer and without once looking around she threw rob roy into a lope her head erect and a red spot on her cheeks she was determined to make that fork in the road first she did but to her surprise the white horse did not take the road going down to the old baskin place in a moment he and his rider were beside her good eft good evening said a well-oiled voice which sounded for all its smoothness as if it might rasp when the time came oh good evening said virginia politely she had been beaten but she need not let him know it i thought once i heard somebody behind me they kept up an intermittent conversation during which virginia took herself severely to task amon's baird really never had done anything that she should feel so toward him why couldn't she treat him decently as her mother had said of course he was common and all that but then she made an honest effort to be civil but girls are queer compounds and contradictory the thing that virginia most disliked in amos baird was that he liked her i suppose you hear from bev often he remarked and virginia instantly resented the familiarity do you mean my brother she asked the rebuff dropped from amon's baird's coat of complacency like water from the back of one of his own muscovies yes i always call him bev most of them do around the neighborhood don't they his friends call him that sometimes yes we hear from him frequently 
i suppose you hear from young lay full as often don't you he looked at her with a glance that was meant for playful badinage but the man was clumsy and very much in earnest when the badinage reached her she took it for what it really was impertinent curiosity besides badinage must be between peers i suppose they hear from him she said coldly he was impervious to the change of pronouns but even he could not help perceiving the change of atmosphere he would not abandon the subject however for he had carefully planned it to lead up to his main proposition it must be pretty lonesome for you without the boys he pursued and it's lonesome down at the old baskin place all the time say virginia i've been thinking that that seeing you are lonesome and i am lonesome we might have you any objections to our keeping company this winter it was an innocent enough proposition couched in the language of his part of the country and his class but virginia had never even heard the expression and the idea of Amon's baird presuming to call her virginia and to say such a thing anyway she was furious i don't know what you mean mr baird she said when she had found her voice through her astonishment and i do not care for any explanation if you will excuse me i will ride on as i am in something of a hurry her words were civil enough but her manner was a slap in the face she could hardly have put more contemptuousness into it moreover it put a quietus upon his hopes for the present at least the campaign upon which he had hoped to enter would evidently be unsuccessful the girl did understand every evil passion in the man was aroused he laid a heavy hand on her horse's bridle and brought him to a walk by god you won't ride on till you've heard me out he said between set teeth i guess there ain't any law against a man's telling a girl he likes her and wants to keep company with her let go my horse you wait till i let go my horse i tell you he tightened his grasp and gave a wicked leer into her white face they were alone on the road but if he thought to cow her thus he had mistaken the girl in her right hand was a riding whip without warning she brought it down in a stinging blow on his hand he gave a howl of rage and pain and involuntarily his grasp relaxed had virginia been a less expert horsewoman she might have been in the dust at his feet after all for rob roy felt the insult of a blow dealt out to a meaner creature and leaped forward but she was braced for the leap and kept her seat though the package of books fell to the ground a swift glance over her shoulder showed that he was not in pursuit but for all that she did not draw rein till she was at the big gate at keswick her excited account of it was characteristically received and what did you do miss nanny asked breathlessly when virginia got as far as the stopping of her horse i gave him a cut with my riding whip why virginia exclaimed her mother and served him right miss nanny asserted stoutly such a man can't be reached except through his hide nan you are as bad as virginia when colonel trevelyan heard of it he fairly raged that a woman should be held up on the highway in such high-handed fashion seemed to a man of his birth and traditions to say nothing of his somewhat inflammable temperament a monstrous thing he got on his horse and rode straight over to the old baskin place amon's baird had reached home and came sullenly out when called for by colonel trevelyan he stopped long enough to arm himself though and he held one hand across the red welt on the other he listened in dogged silence while the colonel used up five minutes and his extensive vocabulary in telling him what he thought of him and then he said with a sneer well 
you can call me out if you want to like you did the other man i ain't afraid to meet you it was an untimely recalling of the fact well known in the community but never adverted to that the colonel in his hot-headed youth had once met a man in mortal combat on the field of honor call you out he roared you let me tell you sir that a gentleman calls out only gentlemen i would sooner challenge your hound yonder but i'll tell you what i will do if ever i hear of your molesting a woman again on the public highway in jackson county be it my daughter or a negro wench i'll cowhide you within an inch of your life sir he drew out a yellow silk bandana and wiped his heated face things have come to a pretty pass if our women can't ride about the country without fear of insult from some blackguard of a fellow come here from the lord knows where for the lord knows what are we to have the methods of kansas turned loose upon us if so we'd better send for the kansas slayer and be done with it by the eternal a man like you deserves a bullet in the forehead why sir he stopped struck dumb by the look on the man's face during the first part of this arraignment amon's baird had stood in sullen defiance the hot blood flaming in his swarthy cheek for no man however debased can hear such words from fellow man without resentment but as colonel trevelyan finished the blood receded a grayish pallor crept over his face and a look a hunted look of abject terror into his eyes he drew back and glanced quickly over his shoulder with an involuntary movement of his hand toward his head he seemed almost to have forgotten his visitor but when colonel trevelyan had turned his horse's head and he stood alone amon's baird remembered all those stinging words that had fallen like blows upon him and the blood came back to his face with a rush and a malignant gleam took the place of the terror in his eyes he shook his clenched hand after his departing visitor with a gesture of menace and his face was that of a bad man who means mischief by god he said hoarsely i'll pay you for this old man if it takes me forty years colonel trevelyan said little about the interview when he got home and nothing at all of the thing that he recalled about it with the most interest but he pondered over that look deeply it had been a random shot but it had brought down the game could it be possible that amon's baird was nonsense End of chapter eight recording by john brandon chapter nine of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter nine the loom house academy in spite of mammy's defection and the logical reason therefore the new school opened with every prospect of success the charm of novelty is nowhere more potent than with the race that miss abby was seeking to uplift they may lack staying qualities but not enthusiasm colonel trevilian gave her all the assistance she could desire except that he would not require any of them to attend they might go if they so elected but there should be no compulsion in the matter he had uncle peter the farm carpenter make some puncheon benches and a long table for the prospective scholars virginia her ardor undampened by her recent adventure undertook to see that the room was in readiness with liz's help this was done and when the hour came the old loom house with its two tallow candles on the mantelpiece two more on the table and the crackle and glow of a hickory fire was not an unattractive place for keswick's rival school the lighting was reinforced at the last minute by mammy's contribution of a saucer of grease in which was a twisted rag for a wick it is impossible to say whether it was love of virginia 
that prompted this offering or a natural curiosity to see the schoolhouse without a sacrifice of dignity in going thither at any rate the oriental lamp was brought by her and deposited in the middle of the table where it did its humble best to illuminate a somewhat dark scene at the signal the dinner fell in virginia's hands they came in a motley crew headed by old uncle bob crippled and deaf who usually went to roost with the chickens they ranged in age down to kylines youngest uncle bob's grandchild if modern methods had been in vogue then they might have had the stimulus of class instruction for they were all at a it really was more of an attendance than miss abby had dared hope for they more than filled the benches on each side of the long table virginia promptly seated the overflow of tender years on the floor in front of the fire where they sat most properly except for an occasional nervous giggle miss abby had intended to open the school with prayer and had so informed virginia but when they were seated and looking up into her face with that dumb expectancy which she always found so pathetic she was suddenly seized with stage fright if the expression could be so far wrested from its proper place as to refer to prayer never in her whole self-possessed life had she felt so embarrassed virginia's quick intuition saw the trouble and a way up call on uncle reuben she whispered miss abby obeyed and how uncle reuben did pray the new england woman listened in a sort of dazed wonder she had conscientiously determined to open every session with prayer her own of course which she knew would be halting and imperfect but better than none she relinquished the intention before the old man was half through uncle reuben was more at home here than she was when she reached home that night she was in a state of excitement that forbade sleep it seemed to her that this experiment was fraught with no end of possibilities for those she sought to help miss abby confidently believed that the end of the black man's bondage was near at hand and she was permitted to have some small share in preparing him for the new life that was before him she must tell somebody about it she drew her table before the fire and wrote what joy that letter would bring to the faithful ones at home waiting for the coming of the day keswick jackson county missouri november eighteen fifty nine my dear father i have delayed my usual letter several days because i had something of importance to communicate and did not wish to do so until after to-night you will rejoice with me i know that the opportunity i so earnestly desired in coming to a slave state that is to be able to do something to ameliorate the condition of these poor creatures has come to me earlier than i dared hope i shall have the inestimable privilege of leading them to the fountain of knowledge that they may slake their thirst when we reflect how long it has been withheld from them we can well imagine what that thirst must be it has all come about in the most natural manner possible i can see the hand of providence in it all when i broached the subject of teaching them i expected the most bitter opposition but god had put it into the hearts of colonel trevilian and his wife who really are very good people though slaveholders to second my efforts and almost before i could ask my request was granted i must say that they have been very cordial in their support of my plans to-night i began work in a disused building called the loom house and had a most gratifying attendance the women for some unexplainable reason do not take hold of it as the men do but i hope they will come in time their ignorance is appalling why they actually do not know the alphabet and some of them are old men it will be slow work but i hope much from their deep interest i go from one to another hearing them say the letters i have told them and often by the time i have got around they will have forgotten the first ones virginia who is a very bright attractive girl though she laughs too much helped me to-night she does not seem to mind in the least going near them but i am ashamed to say that as anxious as i am to help them i feel a repugnance at coming in contact with them that as yet i am not able to conquer i strive constantly against the feeling but it is so strong that it seems to me they must almost be aware of it and they were 
but that is not the way for me to feel and i hope to overcome it by strong effort and prayer i consider them downtrodden and oppressed and i want them to have their rights but really i am glad that we are not likely to have very many of them in massachusetts it seems so strange to me that none of the family here seem to have this repugnance at all there was one thing that surprised me very much i felt so strangely embarrassed when i came before those old men that i felt unequal to beginning with prayer as i had intended doing i think it is best to give them some religious instruction and virginia suggested my calling on uncle reuben the carriage driver of whom i wrote to you i did so and have hardly ever heard a better prayer coming from one who does not even know his letters it is astonishing they certainly have had more religious instruction than we have been led to believe or else he is in communication with the fountain-head virginia says he is the exhorter at the prayer meetings which they hold from cabin to cabin this country is full of surprises to me you know we had always supposed that they were not allowed to hold any kind of gatherings i feel so uplifted in spirit that i am permitted to do this work and i hope for great things with their hunger for knowledge it will be a pleasure to teach them and i think or at least i hope i shall get over the feeling i spoke of pray for me that i may not faint by the wayside while they struggle on your affectionate daughter abby ann cheever miss abby wrote this letter in a kind of spiritual exaltation it was on foolscap paper with a square left blank in the middle of the last page she folded it dexterously so that the writing was hidden and sealed it with red wax envelopes for general use had not then reached the prairie and miss abby was economical they were full of talk the next morning at the breakfast-table about the school and miss abby told of her surprise which she could not get over at uncle reuben's prayer oh reuben makes a good prayer said colonel trevilian and what is more he lives up to the grade of his praying did he ask the lord to send down his sanctum sanctorum upon you miss abby looked blank his sanctum sanctorum she questioned yes the bishop tells about being down at one of their meetings in virginia once and the old preacher wanted to do his best by them and he prayed that god would send down his sanctum sanctorum upon them the next morning the old preacher who was the carriage driver took his master's guests to the boat the bishop thought he would get his idea of what it meant you know they are more careful to get sound than sense miss abby miss abby had noticed it to the great confusion of her ideas she could not always follow mammy on account of it well the bishop said to him uncle i was very much obliged to you for all the good things called down upon me last night but i wanted to ask you just what you meant by his sanctum sanctorum the old darkey scratched his head a moment and then said well master i don't jes exactly know what dat word do mean but i know what i meant by it well what's that asked the bishop i meant give em de best you got they laughed heartily over the story and miss abby remarked uncle reuben didn't say that but he prayed that we might be fed from a low rack i thought that was good it was expressive enough to one who has ever seen stock try to reach up to a high one said the colonel reuben's prayers are full of symbolism his metaphors are a little mixed sometimes but they are always striking miss abby that prayer was for you laughed mrs trevilian uncle reuben was afraid you would shoot over their heads well jake knows three letters anyway if he never learns any more declared virginia round o crooked s and t i skipped about i want to know i began at the beginning and taught them straight down it hardly seemed orthodox to her to do any other way i tried to teach him q said virginia with a reminiscent gurgle of laughter but he couldn't remember it all he could tell was that it was dat un what got a tail hitch on virginia are you going to help miss abby every night there was evident disapproval in miss nanny's voice yes em as long as they come i think it's fun miss abby did not quite understand virginia's qualifying clause 
i shall need you all winter she said you are a great help to me miss nanny smiled that inscrutable smile that always made miss abby uncomfortable the school began on tuesday uncle bob held out till friday when he concluded that the late hours were too much for him he was doubtless led to this decision by aunt viney's scorn of any old fool nigger wi' one foot in de grave settin down studyin a b a b's stidder gittin a good night's rest conjugal scorn will tell even on elderly ideals when saturday came logan one of the younger men and one that miss abby counted on most was missing he had gone to his wife's house which miss abby considered a most reprehensible thing to do seeing that he had to miss a night's schooling to do it mrs trevilian had suggested that saturday was a bad night to have school but miss abby had said grimly that they needed all the time there was there was none to lose liz too was kept away by a visit from a neighboring gallant on mr swamscott's farm miss abby felt that it was inexcusable for them to let such trivial things interfere with what should be the absorbing interest in life to them why of course logan wants to go to his wife's house said mrs trevilian half indignantly when the grievance was laid before her and he ought to go he has a sick child can't the mother take care of it asked the lady whose teaching instincts were easily stirred but whose human impulses were as yet held in abeyance he will forget everything he has learned before monday then let him forget mrs trevilian said this time more than half indignantly don't you suppose they have any natural affection liz's case was even worse she was simply out sparkin as carline explained it may be said in her defense that her lover too could come over but once a week i told you you'd better not have school on saturday said mrs trevilian that is their night jake stayed by her until he had mastered half the alphabet and then his own fireside began to seem more enticing than the loom house academy miss abby did not like for them to come in their working clothes and the strain of wearing sunday fixins on weekdays was too much for jake caroline she loud i was too old to learn anyway he explained to his irate instructress when she demanded the reason of his withdrawal nobody is too old to learn that wants to learn she had replied with emphasis and there she unwittingly struck the keynote of the difficulty they had no strong abiding desire to learn it had been a craving for novelty more than a hunger for knowledge that had prompted their attendance in the first place miss abby was inexpressibly disappointed in them why they dropped out on the slightest pretext and as colonel trevilian had distinctly stated that he would not compel their attendance there really was nothing to do but to let them go the younger ones held on longer urged thereto by parental authority which can sometimes see a good thing for one's offspring more clearly than for one's self but even this following daily grew thinner uncle reuben had held firm amidst the exodus he wanted to learn how to read but when it was proposed to hold a protracted meeting and the loom house was needed for it uncle reuben too wavered and succumbed the meeting was more important than the school also more enjoyable to say that miss abby was grieved at the ignoble failure of her effort is to put it mildly she was chagrined beyond expression it seemed to her that the fault must be in her it could not be possible that any people could be so lacking in enterprise and love of learning she was disgusted with them and angry with herself she did not stop to reason that ambition is a thing of inheritance and that their inheritance had been in the line of sloth they actually seemed satisfied to remain in ignorance she said to mrs trevilian in bewildered helplessness they are you can see for yourself that they are contented they would rather have their play parties and their prayer meetings than all the learning that you can give them they are very much like children 
you could not advance a stronger argument against slavery cried miss abby with heat that they are satisfied with their condition is the deepest degradation of all it has taken away their manhood and womanhood and left them content with a mere animal existence it is worse to destroy the soul than to enslave the body infinitely worse that is no argument at all heaven forbid that i should argue said mrs trevilian hastily i am no yankee i am only stating a fact that you yourself have discovered miss abby wrote again to her father that night from the loom house could be heard the sound of many voices singing the monotonous hymns so full of resonant sound and so void of sense to any but the singers it irritated her to hear them she felt that that letter would be taken in far-off new england as an admission that she had ingloriously capitulated at the beginning of the war and yet how little they knew about it her very first doubt of the wisdom of trying to settle the great problem at long range came over her the letter was written from a full heart they drop out she wrote on the most trivial pretexts a man's wanting to go to his wife's house a girl to entertain her beau from another farm the children because they are sleepy etc you see the slaves are permitted to marry those on neighboring farms and when saturday night comes each man thinks he must go to his wife's house as they always say think of allowing such silly things to interfere with the serious matter of education and they may never have another opportunity like this i am out of all patience with them they are so emotional if they can only get together and sing their senseless hymns and shout and carry on they are perfectly happy and at this moment there rolled up from the improvised sanctuary a wave of ecstatic melody jesus through the heavens ride o oh my lord with two white horses side by side and o oh my lord he's a lily of the valley and o oh my lord he's a lily of the valley and o oh my lord miss abby closed the window which she had opened because she was so hot such childishness End of chapter nine chapter ten of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter ten a grown-up man if the colored school at keswick was a failure and miss abby was forced to confess to herself that it was the white one was a most abundant success never in the history of the neighborhood had there been a school so well attended and so satisfactory in every way miss abby's methods were advanced and her scholarship beyond question why she had an intimate acquaintance with latin and was even teaching ike swamscott the rudiments of greek the ladies of this conservative neighborhood looked covertly for ink stains and disheveled hair when they heard of these heights of attainment classical learning was not unknown even in that day on the frontier but it was strictly limited to the sex supposed to be able to grasp it a latin scholar in petticoats was a rare bird on grand prairie and feminine knowledge of the world's most polished language was limited to alpha and omega the first and the last of st john the divine so often however had they heard this much in prayer and sermon that it had come to be invested with a kind of sacred solemnity and when mrs trevilian once accidentally overheard beverly in the exuberance of youthful spirits and recent acquisition running over his alpha beta gamma delta with its inevitable paraphrase of adder beater dammer pelter she was shocked beyond expression and realized that the new learning was beset with dangers so successful was miss abby's school that before christmas colonel trevilian and the rest were making their plans to secure her for the coming year of course as some of the ladies said she had a brother in lawrence but that really was not her fault and perhaps he was not an abolitionist after all 
it was not right to condemn a man unheard the hearing came off sooner than they expected miss abby had a letter one day that threw the trevilian household into great excitement her brother dr cheever announced that he would be over at christmas to spend a day or two with her write to him and tell him to arrange to stay at least a week said mrs trevilian hospitably two if he can could you board him here miss abby questioned board him miss abby do you suppose i would charge your brother board write to him to come exactly as you would if you were in your mother's house these missouri people certainly were hospitable miss abby thought as she wrote the message but of course it was easy to be hospitable with all these negroes to do the work when jake stood ready to take the horses and mammy to make the fires and aunt viney to wring the chickens necks and all were in such a ridiculous state of delight at having company which was all true enough but then it is always easier when it runs in the blood and it had run in the trevilian blood since the memory of man virginia and sally devereux speculated not a little as to what dr cheever would look like one predicting that he would be fat and bald the other that he would be tall and thin with a general odor of asafoetida and spectacles over which he would look at them if they giggled and they would be sure to giggle which they proceeded now to do hysterically just to prove that they were not past the stage i know he'll be prim prophesied virginia of course sally assented he couldn't be miss abby's brother and not be prim i suppose he will say i presume and good afternoon and maybe tuesday and hadn't ought yes and i want to know and virginia drew down her brows and spoke the words with a voice so like miss abby's that sally went into fresh convulsions well you may look for me to spend most of this week at you all's house but she did not as sally took occasion to remind her afterward no mrs trevilian was saying to miss nanny about the same time i don't really expect to enjoy the visit very much but i want to be nice to miss abby's brother i suppose he will see the weak points in our missouri farming and tell us about them as miss abby does about my management they were out on the porch to meet him leaving roaring fires and all sorts of good cheer inside virginia and miss nanny kept back in the doorway and mammy was taking a surreptitious peep from behind the parlor curtains isn't he little whispered virginia but he is awfully handsome dr cheever greeted miss abby affectionately and acknowledged his presentation to mrs trevilian with courteous cordiality i'm very glad to meet you madam i feel that i know you already from my sister's letters and most pleasantly he had a cultured voice and said madam like a virginian miss nanny was inwardly commenting where did he learn to do that ah miss trevilian and he bowed low over miss nanny's hand then he turned to the girl beside her and without waiting for an introduction said and this i am sure must be miss virginia my sister's assistant he was going to say in a spirit of raillery but remembering miss abby's grief at the fate of that venture and having the tact that can spare its own flesh and blood a rare kind he finished my sister's star pupil virginia blushed and somehow felt strangely immature and underdone when they were in the parlor he said mrs trevilian you have a beautiful place here it reminds me of some of the old colonial homes on the atlantic seaboard abby you remember the old williams place with the columns this reminds me of it this was modeled after an old colonial home mrs trevilian said but not in your part of the country i think oh but i have been in virginia he exclaimed eagerly i spent two teaching years there i have seen mount vernon and arlington house and monticello these columns are very familiar to me oh have you seen monticello cried miss nanny albemarle is our old home it was an instant bond of sympathy between them so the talk fell upon virginia and its customs and people about which they delighted to talk and then turned to differing types of architecture colonial and otherwise in which their visitor led virginia listened with deepest interest she had never thought before about there being 
any distinctive types of architecture north or south there was an eager give-and-take that put them at once upon an easy footing miss nanny could not help contrasting it all with the first night miss abby was with them when they sat down to the table dr cheever exclaimed like a boy beaten biscuits i haven't seen any since i was in virginia and they were at it again then emmeline withdrew nominally to replenish the plate but really to report you won't have to tell him what waffles is he's discoursing right now about beet biscuits and old figinny and the white folks can't beat him on airy one colonel remarked dr cheever when they had returned to the parlor it seems to me you hear more of counties in virginia and missouri than in the north i've noticed that said miss abby with surprise they always talk here about going over to lafayette or to cass when they really mean they're going to some town in lafayette or cass and miss trevilian has just said she was from albemarle county virginia and that dr lay your neighbor is from fayette county kentucky but if he had been telling you he would have said he was from near lexington put in miss nanny and the family smiled dr cheever smiled too in sympathy though he did not see the point i suppose the reason is that we of the south are an agricultural people sir and live largely on farms and plantations returned colonel trevilian we haven't many cities in missouri as you northern people count cities they were gathered around the big wood fire in the parlor now virginia on an ottoman at miss nanny's side over in the corner dr cheever from his place in the centre of the group found his eyes wandering in her direction frequently she took almost no part in the conversation except with her eyes but a sympathetic listener is sometimes the most agreeable companion and virginia was listening with ear and eye she was finding the talk of this grown-up gentleman so well dressed so self-possessed and easy in his manner so evidently a man of the world intensely interesting he had something to say and knew how to say it i think perhaps there is an underlying reason a little deeper even than that colonel he was saying the two parts of the country were differently organized you know that in new england the township was the unit of representation in the colonial legislature but in virginia it was not the parish that was the unit of representation it was the county the colonel assented he really had not thought of this before well that difference is very significant as the political life of new england was built up out of the political life of the towns so the political life of virginia was built up out of the political life of the counties this was partly as you say because they were on plantations and those plantations were not grouped about a compact village nucleus like the small farms at the north and partly i am inclined to think because there was never in virginia that puritan theory of the church according to which each congregation is a self-governing democracy don't you think there is something in that undoubtedly returned the colonel i hadn't thought of it before in just that way but i can see that there would be the difference that you suggest yes i studied it up a little when i was in virginia these sectional peculiarities interest me it was one of dr cheever's conversational charms that he was always saying things on any subject brought up that nobody had thought of before but that they could see at once after he had talked three minutes about it some persons are strongest in their ability to inspire thought the colonel was thinking how pleasant it was to discuss in this broad way points of difference between north and south without having the everlasting subject of slavery lift its head it couldn't be done with miss abby that is a striking portrait you have there colonel the visitor remarked looking up at old colonel trevilian of albemarle above the mantel my father sir returned the colonel with pride yes sir it is a fine picture of a fine old country gentleman it reminds me of one i saw abroad i forget just where that was but it was by an american artist and was labelled a colonial gentleman and the talk drifted to europe and his travels he certainly was changed in the cradle declared miss nanny when she and virginia were upstairs after an evening in which everybody 
had appeared at his best and there was not time to say all the things clamouring to be said the same mother never bore him and miss abby he certainly is one of the most agreeable gentlemen i have ever met why you wouldn't know except from his pronunciation that he was not from virginia perhaps it is because he has been abroad aunt nan virginia spoke almost in an awed tone i never have seen anybody before that had been to europe neither have i there are not many people that get to europe i can tell you but the same mother had borne them impossible as it seemed and the very things that had made miss abby what she was had made him what he seemed miss abby was the eldest of a new england family to whom bread and an education were the necessities of life butter and the numberless little refinements whose sum total is culture were its luxuries in her rigid determination that each cheever in turn should have the first the last had slipped from her own stiffening fingers this brother was the youngest he should have such advantages as she would have given her own right hand for and so she had taught school to fit him for college she had scrimped and saved to help him through yale she had denied herself travel and alluring luxuries of every sort that he might study abroad when he had proved that it would be worth while and she had done all this until saving and calculating had become to her second nature and an object in themselves but the struggle which had left her less lovable perhaps than she might have been had there been no struggle had left him free to use his powers to the utmost it is true that he had scrupulously refunded to her the money advanced but who can return the heart of a sacrifice which is the life-blood that has gone into it but it had been a free-will offering and she was having her reward to-night as she saw him holding his own in wit and repartee and graver themes with this old virginia family between whom and herself there had always been an impalpable social barrier abiel was a match for them all she was thinking and abiel was her idol End of chapter ten chapter eleven of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter eleven a chapter of border history as might have been expected dr cheever entered heartily into the life of the neighbourhood which was unusually gay at this christmas season a man of his adaptability could hardly fail to fit in anywhere the first thing was a horseback ride over to sally devereux's which was successfully accomplished after dr cheever was once in the saddle virginia lost her awe of him during that ordeal and was able to laugh and talk with him afterward just as if he had always been a dweller on the prairie when sunday came he innocently suggested being quite in love with his new accomplishment that he and virginia ride but virginia reminded him that it would hardly be fair for her to take him away from miss abby and he agreed at once to go in the carriage if she would you are crazy virginia said to miss nanny who privately urged her to ride if dr cheever wanted to go that way even miss nanny had fallen under his spell do you suppose i am going to ride to church with anybody that has to have his horse brought up to the blocks oh, i wouldn't hear the last of it for a year he gets into a carriage beautifully but at the church she thought with a concern she had never felt before of how it must all strike one who had seen all that dr cheever had seen at home and abroad if their guest felt any amusement however at the crudities of the little church he was too well bred to disclose it by word or look there were parties that week and a wedding and an inn fair the next day at the groom's house and the trevilians were kept busy with it all during all this time there had never been a reference to the border troubles that had kept missouri and kansas in an uproar for the last five years such portions of the two states at least 
as had been adjacent they all recognized that as a dangerous topic and yet both gentlemen had felt a growing desire to talk it over before they parted for each felt sure now that he would have a reasonable person to talk to it was the last day of dr cheever's visit and they were all seated around the open fire in mrs trevilian's room which after the custom of the country was the general sitting-room all that is except miss abby who was busy with school papers i saw a man to-day as we were coming home from dr lay's said dr cheever thoughtfully with half-closed eyes that i am sure i have seen before who was it asked mrs trevilian what did you say his name was miss virginia emmons baird she replied turning uncomfortably red oh said miss nanny an old friend of virginia's her niece shot an indignant glance at her and frowned at her mother giving imploring pinches meanwhile at her father's arm as she leaned against him she did not want dr cheever to hear that story emmons baird repeated dr cheever oblivious of this little family by-play his eyes were closed now in his effort to fit name and face together i never heard of emmons baird that i know of but i am sure i have seen that face it is not one to forget now is it he appealed to the colonel it is not his host replied he was thinking of it as he saw it that day last fall the white terror in it had stayed with him for days where do you think you have seen him in kansas unless i am greatly mistaken i think he is one of a company that came in there in fifty five you know that about that time they were coming in from almost everywhere i think this man was one of them oh i reckon not doctor at least he is a slaveholder now he bought a man and a woman soon after he came to this neighborhood a man that had come out to make kansas a free state would hardly do that how long has he been in this neighborhood about a year and a half or two years i can't say exactly i think i've seen that man in kansas dr cheever insisted let me see you have seen pretty much all of this kansas missouri trouble haven't you doctor i think miss abby told me you were one of the first to go yes sir i was in the second company that got to lawrence the first one preceded us by about six weeks they pitched their tents on the present site of lawrence august one eighteen fifty four you didn't lose much time remarked the colonel dryly i believe the kansas nebraska bill was signed only the may before well colonel laughed dr cheever you people were so quick on the triggers that we didn't have any time to lose you were here before us as it was we entered the territory immediately sir and we did as soon as we could get there they both laughed they had wanted to do it all along and now they were safely started miss abby being away and miss nanny sitting with lips shut tight they thought they could get through it all right it was a race said colonel trevilian and you beat us that is about all there was to it well colonel you gave us a good run there's no denying that i don't think you have anything to reproach yourselves with at the spring election in eighteen fifty five you polled more votes than there were voters in this state you couldn't hope to do more than that and he threw back his head with a hearty laugh in which they all joined i don't deny it sir i don't deny it but we thought we were fighting the devil with fire you were bound to have the state and so were we the trouble was colonel that you took up only a voting residence if you had gone to stay now as we did i don't know about that the impression prevailed here that yours was a fighting residence you know there was a great dearth of women and agricultural implements in those companies is it true doctor as we have heard asked mrs trevilian that one company was sent out to kansas from new england armed with bibles and sharps rifles and told to use both i believe it is admitted dr cheever they were from new haven and were known as the rifle christians but that was later mrs trevilian after it seemed necessary for them to control the poles and protect themselves we understood that both were presented by a minister of the gospel yes they were by henry ward beecher miss nanny shut her lips tight 
you know what the inspecting officer said about the companies sent in by way of nebraska after our patrol of the missouri had barred them out that way asked colonel trevilian what was that colonel he said i do not see many spinning wheels sticking out of the wagons but he found a remarkable assortment of farming implements sir muskets carbines sharpshooters revolvers and ammunition and these are the implements with which southeastern kansas has been farmed for several years you know that doctor well such crops never fail no said dr cheever shaking his head and what is more they follow the law of the harvest which is increase they sat in silence a moment and then colonel trevilian said doctor whatever was the nature of the first emigration to kansas its character later was clearly warlike you can't gainsay that and you can't wonder that we felt alarmed there are a hundred thousand slaves in missouri ten thousand of them in jackson and lafayette counties and we are right here on the border we fully believed that you had come down here to incite an insurrection to arm them and get up a servile war that threat was made on the streets of weston sir you know john brown was right here and he did his best that affair on the potawatomi was a butchery oh old oh, john brown exclaimed miss nanny as if words were inadequate understand that i don't endorse john brown said dr cheever hastily i believe the time will come when john brown and his methods will be repudiated by his own party if we had had money enough continued colonel trevilian who had been pursuing his own train of thought we should have won we could have brought our people here from the south just as you did from the north paid their way and made it an object for them to come but then we didn't have the money so there's no use talking about it colonel dr cheever stopped and then went on valiantly it was not the money you lacked you think it was a high moral purpose asked mrs trevilian smiling i didn't say that i would not dare to with miss nanny sitting so close no she said shaking her head at him you'd better not i didn't and i'm not going to would you miss virginia she shook her head no adding coaxingly go on i love to hear you and father talk i don't know about all that said colonel trevilian returning to the charge i concede to you dr cheever and men like you the highest possible motive in giving up your life in the east and coming here to kansas i think you were wrong but i trust i am not so unacquainted with principle myself that i cannot recognize it in other men dr cheever with a sudden impulse extended his hand thank you colonel he said with much earnestness colonel trevilian took the offered hand in a cordial clasp it seemed almost like a pledge of friendship come what might you are all right my boy he said heartily you are all right from your point of view of course you were born on the wrong side of the line to get the right point of view but i tell you doctor all the men that have come to kansas are not of your stamp probably not i know in fact that the later companies were not always selected with much care indeed it would have been impossible to discriminate and weed out undesirable persons yes but when you put a money motive before men for allying themselves with a movement and at the same time give them the shelter of a high moral purpose it is not surprising if unprincipled men take advantage of it and some unprincipled men came out with those companies that i know now you take this man tigerman for instance right here in this neighborhood he came out with one of these very companies that you were speaking of those that took in rag tag and bobtail i don't remember that i said quite that began dr cheever no but i did now tigerman had his expenses paid out here to settle in kansas but when he got to kansas city he looked over into the territory and found it bare and rather poor picking and then over into missouri where the farms were well stocked and the farmers prosperous and he forgot his cause and dropped down here what do you think of that i hope he will stay kansas is better off without him i hope he will go missouri doesn't want him then there is emmons baird 
you say you are pretty sure he belonged to a company that came out to make kansas a free state and he is here now a slaveholder i tell you such men have no principle or if they have it is of the quicksilver variety you never can put your finger on it they are in the free state movement or any other movement for what they can get out of it now to my mind he continued thoughtfully there are three kinds of men in kansas men of honor like yourself actuated by the most exalted humanitarian principle i concede that they are there and i am glad they are for god knows they are needed then second there are men of the john brown stripe fanatics sir with principle of a certain kind perhaps but no sense to balance it and a fanatical fool is always a dangerous man then last and worst blatherskites like tigerman who have sense of a certain kind but no principle to balance it they may not all be bad men now either but men without fixed principles are always in danger of becoming bad men and dangerous men if the opportunity comes strengthen your own class doctor for if the john browns and the tigermans ever come to the front they will give kansas a black eye that she will not get over in a day i suppose there are bad men everywhere dr cheever remarked reflectively yes but you will find more where they are rushed in for a purpose with pecuniary rewards in plain sight you thought so when we went over to help you vote and it is all the worse when they are under a banner dubbed philanthropy we called ours plain self-interest i suppose it is hard to say just which side has been the most to blame in this dreadful border warfare said mrs trevilian yes mrs trevilian it is hard to get down to the real beginning of a war of retaliation and from first to last this missouri kansas trouble has been of that kind though i know many people in the east who could not be persuaded that that is true but i think it is over i believe the peace they celebrated down here at fort scott last summer will be a lasting one i hope so from the bottom of my heart said colonel trevilian but you mark my words doctor he raised his finger and punctuated his utterances with it if war with its opportunities and its temptations to unbridled license should ever come and men of the tigerman stripe get the whip-hand in kansas god save the state and god save the border said mrs trevilian with sudden prescience they sat in silence a few moments and then colonel trevilian said i suppose you have seen some stormy times in kansas doctor i have indeed and it is not entirely over yet there is still a good deal of lawlessness it is better than it was but life is pretty cheap but colonel one of the strangest things i have come across one of the hardest to unravel is going on there right now do you know there is a mysterious somebody going around that country putting his mark on this man and that and the other and when the mark is there the man is gone none of them live to tell the tale and that mark asked the colonel with interest is a bullet hole in the centre of the forehead it never varies and i suppose i've seen a dozen of those men virginia was leaning against her father from the ottoman which was her favourite seat she sat up now and looked at the speaker with fascinated eyes which dilated and darkened as she listened this must be what dr lay was telling us about father undoubtedly i think he said it had been going on for several years from what he could hear yes sir the first that i ever heard of it was four years ago this winter in eighteen fifty six a man was found dead out on the prairie west of town i was called to examine him it seemed a peculiar case to me then because it was such a clean piece of work well sir in about two months i was called again to examine a man discovered in the woods not far away it was exactly such a case a single bullet had pierced the brain since then the cases have multiplied until it positively seems almost dangerous to live in the community is it always in the vicinity of lawrence 
no not always i heard the other day of a victim found two or three counties away the man had left lawrence because he was afraid to stay but his enemy found him out is there no clue to it at all asked mrs trevilian no you can't really say there is a clue to the murderer but a strange coincidence has been noticed that may lead to a clue what is that asked colonel trevilian well at first there were no data to go upon at all for all one could tell it was merely chance that chose each victim young or old rich or poor married or single it was all the same that shut out the idea that it was from the ordinary motives that prompt such deeds it couldn't have been jealousy for some of those men were middle-aged men of family it evidently was not for robbery for the men's pockets were always unrifled remarkable ejaculated the colonel after a while it was noticed that every man killed was a kansan a free state man i mean aha said colonel trevilian thoughtfully is it supposed that this is the work of the missourians in kansas sir no colonel i think that is not held by anybody now there was some feeling at first that it might be but there is absolutely no evidence to prove it in fact no set of men among us have done more to ferret this thing out than the missourians it is clearly the work of one man or a combination of men actuated by the same purpose and having attained the same skill in the use of the revolver and that is a consummate skill mine own idea is that it is the work of a monomaniac a man insane on this one subject still he stopped well queried the colonel i was going to say that one thing which would give color to the theory that it is the work of the pro-slavery faction is that every man found dead has been discovered by tracing the thing back to have been identified with a band of jayhawkers that a few years ago went around kansas doing pretty deadly work i guess from what i can hear hm that looks bad the colonel shook his head i sincerely hope the pro-slavery men would not carry their retaliation to such a length as that does this band still exist no sir they disbanded some time ago i am told and have scattered possibly because the observation had been made that the victims were all from among their number it is a very strange case said colonel trevain very strange indeed you don't know whether this man baird ever lived in kansas asked dr cheever irrelevantly colonel trevilian thought not he had come here from virginia it was said though nobody seemed to know much about him or his antecedents they talked very little about their affairs were quite close-mouthed in fact why oh nothing dr cheever returned i just had a little curiosity about the man i can't get his face out of my mind aunt nan doesn't believe he is a virginian dr cheever said virginia mischievously tell him why aunt nan he may be said miss nanny but i have never seen a virginian before that said hadn't ought have you dr cheever never he laughed you have us there certainly and i've never seen one that couldn't bound his own county either i wish i could see this man and talk with him dr cheever said after a pause i believe i could tell whether he is a virginian from his speech and maybe i could tell some other things from his speech asked virginia yes he said dryly if i could make him speak long enough then he rose come miss virginia let's go for a farewell gallop miss nanny i can actually get up now without a stump i had to give jake a dollar though to get back his respect after having my horse led up to the blocks but i'm learning a good many things ten minutes later they were cantering gaily down the road toward dr lay's for a last call aunt nan said virginia that night as they were undressing she was so under the influence of the kansas story that she would not sleep alone i have the strangest feeling about what dr cheever was telling us i feel perfectly sure that in some way that man i know it is just one is going to come into our lives do you suppose it is a presentiment no returned miss nanny with emphasis it's biliousness 
you need a blue mass pill your liver is out of order aunt nan virginia spoke indignantly you know you have always said i didn't have any liver well you are getting one to talk like that or else you have enlargement of the imagination there is not much difference between the two you have been reading too many of mrs emma d e n southworth's stories or sylvanus cobb jr's i'll put you on a course of calomel and baxter's saint's rest that will hit both virginia clothed her soul with a garment of dignified silence but her last waking thought was he will i know he will End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter twelve a pen and ink sketch about ten days after dr cheever went back to kansas gordon lay away off in lexington kentucky was reading a letter written in a running feminine hand and dated keswick it said i am sure you will want to know all about what sort of a time we had christmas when miss abby's brother was here and what we thought of him so i take my pen in hand etc to tell you all about it you know we expected to have a perfectly funereal time at christmas with you and brother gone of course we were sad when we thought of you but i don't think i ever had a nicer time in my life that's pleasant for a starter said gordon if all grown-up men are like dr cheever sally and i feel that we just can't wait for richmond and lexington to come i know sally has told you what we did and where we went so i will tell you all about dr cheever i am sure that will interest you more than anything else i could write gordon gave a grunt and turned the pages of the letter over cheever to the end confound him well to begin with he is very small but exceedingly handsome i never thought before that i could possibly like a small man but after you know him well you hardly think of his being small he says he thinks men grow too large in the west larger that is than they were intended to be and i don't know but they do i can think now of a good many that seem too tall really father asked him if he did not think that in new england they might be a little undersize but he thinks not if he is small in stature he certainly is not in brain he is the most intelligent man i ever saw in my life why he seems to know something about everything aunt nan says he is what old mrs tolls would call a phenomena by nature and she wasn't making fun either aunt nan thinks he is awfully nice oh he's got them all if miss nanny thinks he is nice groaned gordon there is one funny thing about him though he doesn't know how to ride or at least he didn't when he came i gave him riding lessons while he was here and he got along splendidly we kept the horses saddled most of the time and when there was nothing else to do we went riding he was so anxious to learn doesn't it seem funny to think of a man that can't ride i always supposed they knew by instinct i never heard before of anybody's having to learn but he says they don't ride much in new england they go in buggies dr cheever thinks i am an excellent teacher but severe that's what he said i suppose it was because i told him i positively would not go with him again until he learned to mount from the ground you see the first time we went riding jake brought the horses out and we were on the horse blocks and dr cheever didn't make any motion to bring my horse up and so i told jake to do it and then dr cheever seemed sort of helpless and jake looked wild and i suppose father thought somebody ought to do something so he told jake to lead dr cheever's horse up to the blocks and he did everybody was very grave but when i looked back father had gone straight to the house 
and i could see aunt nan going off into conniptions behind the venetian blinds and i thought jake would have a fit he was just doubled up but dr cheever never knew a word of it he was too busy holding milo in you know gordon milo is the pokiest old thing on the place well we were going over to your father's and i kept wondering how in the world i would get him in the saddle again i knew we would have a perfectly delightful call and that they would be charmed with him as they were but i did dread the scene at the horse-blocks i told sally about it on the sly and do you know she got us out of it in the slickest way she is too cute for anything dr cheever didn't know what she was up to neither did i till it was over i got on my horse i wasn't going to help him if he never got up but sally switched milo around made a bow and said with a great show of ceremony allow me dr cheever this is the way we do in the west and there was the horse ready for him to mount from the blocks and everybody laughing at sally ain't she cute well i tell you it saved the day i told him on the way home that if he was going to ride with me he simply had to learn to mount from the ground that milo would let a baby climb up his legs into the saddle and he could take him down in the pasture where nobody could see him practice till he learned i suppose it was severe but it had to be done now he gets up as well as anybody almost gordon was beginning to take more interest in the subject this letter wasn't bad i suppose you will be thinking from all this that dr cheever doesn't amount to much and he was but when i tell you that he is small and can't ride i have told you the very worst he is a perfectly delightful man to talk to he makes you think things you see he is so well up in books and everything of that kind he has been laying out a course of reading for me and is going to send me the books when he gets home gordon could you lay out a course of reading for a girl i don't believe you could i never even heard you intimate that you thought i needed a course of reading but dr cheever is so cultivated in that line then he has travelled so much and can tell so many interesting things about the places he has seen that makes a man such charming company you know he thinks i ought to go to boston for my finishing year says i would have better advantages there than in richmond in art and all those things but i don't believe a word of it do you i don't believe boston is ahead of richmond in anything i told him so and he just laughed dr cheever talks beautifully about art he has told me things about pictures and statuary that i never dreamed of mother says it is a liberal education to live in the house with him oh they've all got it interpolated gordon everybody likes him even the servants he certainly knows how to make friends he is not a bit like miss abby he put his shoes out to be black the first morning he was here and now they have some respect for him the second morning he put a quarter in the shoes liz says he seems really fond of miss abby isn't it funny of course i like miss abby and think she is a good teacher and all that but i don't really see how anybody could be fond of her there doesn't seem to be anything to catch hold of but he is so different well this is a long letter but i knew you would want to know all about dr cheever and what we thought of him write soon as ever virginia p s dr cheever thinks he will not always remain in kansas he has told me so much about boston and it makes me feel so differently about the place from the way i used to feel i encourage him to go back there if gordon had been a swearing man he would certainly have sworn at this encourage him to go back what concerns of hers was it where he went p s number two i forgot to tell you how much we missed you verge p s number three it seems that i will never get through i just wanted to add that dr cheever is coming over to see miss abby again in about a month he thinks the books will be here by then he says it is so near that he thinks he will come over often and see how she is getting along he seems to be such a good brother v t when gordon finished reading this letter he sat a long time tugging at his moustache which had recently come he felt so hopelessly young End of chapter twelve